Okay. So today's session is the Future Proof Branding in Your Click Apps. Our presenter today is Jeremy Doherty, and my name is Shima Ozins. I'm the host for today. That being said, Jeremy, take it away. Thank you, Shima. Um, oops. Well, first of all, what do I mean by future-proof branding? Uh, when it comes to building maintainability into your apps, that doesn't stop necessarily with your expressions and your load script and your data model. Um, in fact, if you have a branded app, if it's in production for a very long time, it's quite likely that you'll have to apply some updates to the look and feel. And just with, just with any change, as with any changes to an app, the trouble that you'll have to go through in order to apply those changes uh, really ties to decisions that are made during the initial development. So today I'll be discussing a few things that you can do uh, when first developing an app or when applying changes to an app that'll make any look and feel updates uh, a lot more comfortable to apply in the future. Um, now, of course, in that regard, there are differences between click view and click sense, um, both in terms of um, how much control we have over the look and feel itself, as well as what we can do to, uh, to make things easier to update in the future. But I'll be showing some examples of both of those platforms. Um, and as we go along, I'll point out the, uh, what applies to which versions. Um, and now let me tell a quick story to explain how this became something that I try to always incorporate into the initial development of an application. It was a few years ago, I was at a customer site working on a ClickView app in which they had invested uh, quite a bit into the look and feel, uh, both to incorporate their corporate branding standards um, as well as uh, other considerations. And uh, during the time I was there, some workers put up tarps in the lobby covering up the walls. So one day I asked the, the receptionist what was going on, and she said, all I'm allowed to tell you is I can't talk about it and you can't look behind the tarps. So I didn't think much more about it until one Monday I came into the office and the tarps had been pulled down and the company had revealed the, the new, uh, their new image including new colors, the walls had been repainted, uh, new logo, et cetera, as a surprise to their employees. In fact, even most of the IT organization was not aware of this change coming, but then all were told in a mass email that morning to update all applications with the new branding by the end of the week. Now, that's a bit of an extreme example, I realize, but um, it's actually not all that far off from what you may be likely to face. Uh, any look and feel changes company-wide tend to be uh, applied with some degree of urgency, and so we want to make it an, as easy a process as we can. So um, that's enough with storytelling. Let's get into some quick stuff. Um, when it comes to applying branding in particular or look and feel in general, there are really three areas that we're talking about in terms of properties, and those are colors, uh, images and fonts. And most of what we have control over and what we're able to, to build, build in some smarts into our approach has to do with colors. And so that's where I'll be spending most of this time, but I'll touch briefly on the air, other areas as well. So when it comes to colors, um, hopefully you're already storing your color information in variables, um, maybe in an include file for reusability, uh, but what does that look like? There are two approaches that I most commonly uh, see taken in applications. One is a color code will be assigned to a variable named for the color itself. Uh, usually a color name that may come, for example, from a branding guide. And that's a good approach, but it has one drawback, which is that um, 
if the color code should change, then chances are the names will change as well. So you'll have to update this reference in just as many places in your applications as you would if you had just put the color code directly in there. And another approach that's common is to assign the color codes to a variable name for the function that it serves. So for example, headers are blue, so we put the color code for blue uh, in a variable that says, say, header color. Um, and the, the problem with this approach is that you may be still applying the same color in several places, so you may still have multiple updates to make. So then, what to do? Well, the approach that I take is to actually employ both of these methods. Uh, first, I, I store the color code in a variable name for the color, and then assign the color name variable to a variable identifying the purpose that it serves. And the reason that I do this is then it doesn't matter when a change comes along, whether it's a change to the color itself or the way it's utilized. Either way, I have the flexibility built in to update it in just one place and see my changes flow through. So let's take a look at how this looks in practice. So I have a quick view app here, and I am employing some branded colors, which I'm storing in a config file. So in this scenario, we are the Acme company, and uh, these are the Acme company's color codes. And this could be uh, in an Excel file uh, or a, an include script, if you prefer. Um, I just find it a little more flexible in the Excel file. And storing it externally to the application has two advantages. One, of course, is reusability. And another is it may be, depending on the process that you have around code promotion where you work, certainly uh, if with most of my customers, um, there's more process around promoting a change to a ClickView or ClickSense app than there is with an external file. And so uh, it's a, a little more, more nimble to apply the change with uh, fewer approvals and, and less process. But in, in either case, we, get, we have to pull these color codes into the application and um, I chose to do that also in an include file. And so there are three stages in the way that I did it. First, pull in the color uh, codes and names as data. Then I'm going to loop through them and do the variable assignments where I'm pulling the variable name as well as the contents from that file. And then finally, uh, we're going to apply those color codes to their functions. And so in this case, we are talking about uh, chart colors in this example. And so there is one additional step, which is that in the – not sure why some of this is grayed out, uh, sorry, but – in the color properties, <clears throat> we're assigning the colors now uh, not to a code, but to a variable. So here I'm referencing the, the name that uh, stores the, the, sorry, the variable that stores the color reference, not code, for this particular function. So chart one, chart two, and so on. So when I reload the file, the updates will flow in. Now, you may be thinking, well, that's great, but you still had to apply the uh, variable references to the, uh, to the color palette for every single object in which you want this, these colors to appear. Well, 
Yes, that's true, but that's made much easier with a feature that most people know about in ClickView, but few people really take uh, to its fullest advantage, and that is themes. So a theme does not have to be defined around a certain chart type. For example, uh, this is what my bar chart looks like, so for every bar chart, I'm going to apply the bar chart theme. You can define a theme that includes a very narrow range of properties, in this case, just color codes, and when it's applied, only the color information will be overridden and all the other properties will remain intact. So what I did to uh, apply my references to all my charts is to create a theme based on this first chart. So that's done in layout, theme maker, and the first time out I would start with new theme, but the steps that I'll show are the same from there either way. So specific to object type of chart, and you'll see I deselected everything except color map. So this theme contains only the color map, and it's not the codes that become part of the theme, it's the references. So I'll show you why that's significant in a moment. And again, it is applied to just the chart object type. So then for every other object, the only step is to click Apply Theme and choose the theme, and now it's applied. So even if I make further changes, let's say, for example, Acme Company is acquired by Ace Company, and they have their own colors. It's going, any change is going to flow through now that I've applied that theme for all of the objects. So let's quickly do that. I'm just going to uncomment some code in my include file. Save it and reload, and now the colors have changed for all the charts that use that theme. So, oh, and a quick word about themes too, is that they are not stored as part of the QVW file. A theme is a file unto itself, so if you want to share it with someone, you'll have to find that file and give it to them. Uh, or better yet, if you're keeping your QVWs under source control, you can store the themes there as well, so uh, everyone knows where to retrieve them if needed. That was one example of how we may want to apply uh, branded colors to charts, in which we simply want to, we want the same colors used throughout just so that they look good together. But uh, another frequent use case is that you may want the individual values of a given dimension to have to keep a same color throughout the application. So, for example, uh, in the case of the customer where I'm working currently, they will, within their own applications, when they show uh, competitor comparisons, they identify each competitive brand by the color that that brand itself uses in its own marketing. Um, and so that can be done, the, the easy way is by applying persistent colors, but if you want to externalize that information, then um, we can take another approach, which is to pull in the color codes and store them as data. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Okay, so here are our competitors. This is again in my config file, and I have red, green, and blue color values for each. And uh, this, uh, this technique works both in ClickView and in ClickSense. I'm going to show you in ClickSense. And uh, this, this particular technique works in all recent versions of ClickSense, um, and we'll get to another uh, way of applying the same in, in uh, the latest version of ClickSense in a moment. But so we're working in the chart on the left here. Um, well, first of all, let me show the load script briefly. 
So I just wanted to show you that I'm just pulling in those red, green, and blue colors as data. I'll probably add that open. Go back to my app. So then in my chart, under colors, I'm going to choose by expression, and then I have simply an RGB function that pulls in each of those values, and that's all there is to it. Now I see my colors applied. I do want to make a little word of caution here, though, about doing color by expression. There are uh, some known issues with doing so in ClickSense. You can't show a legend, for instance. And also, in general, you have to remember a color expression, even though it may not be the reason for being for your, uh, for your chart, it has the ability to have just as much impact on performance as your measure expression would do. So, um, you know, apply the same good practices to your color expression. It may be uh, calculating more times than you think just to render one chart. And then, finally, to use this technique in particular with the RGB function, only do that if you're sure that all of the members of that dimension are accounted for. If you have a new one come in, chances are you're not going to like the, uh, the effect, especially in click view, uh, which is going to show a black bar. So a couple things to be aware of. Um, now, there's, starting with since June 2017 and beyond, there is a easier way to apply consistent colors for a uh, dimension value across an application, uh, and that's by using the new color by dimension feature. Um, it has a limitation as well, which I'll show you in just a moment, but so we're going to be uh, demonstrating the, uh, that feature using this chart on the right. Okay, so um, in order for this to work, you, your dimension needs to be stored as part of the master library. So first, let's do that. Okay, I still have it in there from last time. We'll just uh, get rid of that and start over. So I'm going to be using a duplicate of that plan field so I don't mess up anything with the other chart. And I'm going to click Add Dimension, and that's all that it asked me. So you're not going to see where you can apply this feature until you go back in and edit the dimension. And so now, under Edit, I have this additional tab, Value Colors, in which um, I can select each value and assign a color to it. I could put in um, a hex code, better yet, but because this is, it does not allow for an expression, I can't externalize this. I'm going to have to make any updates uh, separately once for every application to which the colors need to be applied. But once I make that change, I will just switch to my new dimension and there's another step. And by the way, this confused me for a long time. I first noticed it in uh, June 2017 release desktop. Some of the properties hide. Uh, I thought they were gone completely, but it turns out there's a little um, bar right here that you can identify by uh, seeing a pointy finger when you mouse over it. If you just click on that, your missing properties will come back. So then I need to choose color by dimension, and there you see my colors applied. There is sometimes an additional step in which you have to choose the dimension again underneath the color by dimension, um, but so be aware of that if you don't see the change applied right away. And uh, so before I get, uh, before we um, move on to images and fonts, I also want to mention a little bit about 
what is possible to do branding wise in native sense. Certainly, and this applies to everything we're discussing, uh, almost anything is possible in a mashup. That's a whole other webinar. Uh, mashups are a whole other webinar, and one, in fact, in fact, we have on the zone that you can stream anytime. Uh, but in terms of native ClickSense, one thing that you can do is apply a logo and a color <clears throat> to your uh, sheet titles. That is done in the app settings. If you go to app overview and then app options. Now you'll see I have background color. Uh, I can apply a fade between two colors, a font color, and a logo. Please, if you're applying a color, use a uh, white on clear logo. I'm sure um, one is available if you uh, ask your uh, first signature company who can supply you with that. That's about the limit. Uh, in terms of, of uh, branding in native sense, even applying additional logos in a text object, um, tends to have unpredictable results uh, uh, due to the responsive design on different uh, devices. And again, this is not, we can't make it too future-proof in terms of externalizing anything. This has to be done once per application. Technically, you could swap out the image in the uh, content library with one with the same name, but I don't recommend doing that. We'll just have to update once per application. So images, there is not much really that we can do either in ClickView or ClickSense to make them future-proof since uh, for it, at least in the way that images are used from a branding perspective, logos, et cetera, we can't make a, a dynamic reference um, an expression or a, a file pass reference. We have to apply the image during design time. So if it needs to be updated, that's going to have to be done manually for each occurrence. Likewise with font, there's actually no control over it in native sense, but uh, in click view, you can um, apply a font selection to any object, not dynamically. Uh, but I also want to mention a word about fonts and, and branding in general. Every Corporate branding guide that I've ever seen has two things in common when it comes to fonts. One is they choose some weird font that I've never heard of before as uniquely representing their corporate identity. And number two is they grudgingly accept Arial as a substitute. So if that's the situation you're in, please, please use Arial. If you choose a font that turns out to be not supported uh, on a given user's device, you don't know what they're going to see unless it's iOS, <clears throat> in which case you know that they will see Times New Roman, which is the default uh, in Safari um, and is highly unlikely to achieve the desired effect with the rest of your look and feel of your application. Okay, so that is my uh, presentation. I will send it back to uh, Shima to take any questions that you uh, have entered throughout the webinar. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, it was very interesting. So while, uh, so at this point, I'd like to open up for a question Q&A session. And while you're typing your questions in a Q&A panel, I'd like to let you know that, uh, as you know, this session is recorded as well as all the webinars that we've done in the past. And you can find the recordings in the zone. So if you go to the zone, that infozoneus.com, please go to knowledge base. And if you filter for video, you should be able to find all the recordings that we've done in the past. Okay, that said, let me read out some of the questions here. Um, okay, Jeremy, first question. 
how did you get the click formatting to appear in Notepad? And I was also wondering about this because you saw, uh, I saw some um, commenting feature and such in Notepad, so. Uh, yeah, so that is, um, it's actually Notepad++ and I was using a third party click view language plugin. If you search, uh, if you use Notepad++ and uh, search on click view language plugin, uh, you'll find the file that needs to be installed and instructions to install it. It's a, there's a little bit of trouble to go through to get it installed, um, but it may be worth it if you regularly look at, at uh, script outside of quick view and sense, such as for code reviews, et cetera. Okay, great. Oh, and let me say one more thing about no, what I do use Notepad++ for quite a bit is the uh, compare plugin, which I think may also be a third party thing that you need to uh, install yourself. But that is great for figuring out what changed in between two, uh, two versions of a load script. Uh, you can do a side by side comparison and find out what broke your app. Okay, how do you find that plugin? You just Google it? I, I believe so, yes. I don't think it comes from uh, where you would download the Notepad++ application itself. Okay, I see. Okay, uh, the second question. In your ClickView file, why did the value seem to change when you reload it? Um, yeah, actually that is something I didn't learn until practicing for this session, but uh, I don't know if you're, uh, if you can see my screen or not, or if you can share it, Shima. Sure, um, I'll, but I'll pass it all. For this demo, I was using the built-in dummy script that comes with ClickView and Sense. So if you're not familiar with that, if you want to spin up Jeremy, an app very quickly. We're not on your screen yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, can you see it now? I think it's coming through. Yes, yeah, now we see it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so if you want to spin an app up very quickly just to test something, you know, or you want to uh, post something to the community and you don't want to share your own data, you can open the script editor and enter uh, control QQ in click view or control zero zero, and it fills in a load script um, that when run will uh, create dimensions and measures that you can uh, right away start pulling into charts. That turns out that's based on a random function, and so that every time you reload, the values will change, which is why um, when I reloaded my app, you saw the values change in the charts. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so the next question is, when you were assigning these um, colors to, I think you called it, dimension, uh, I forgot the name of the expression, but the field in a master dimension, you have three values. When you have extra values later on, do you need to assign them manually? And then it applies to all the rest of the charts? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, if you have new values, you would need to go back and revise your dimension. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I think if you fail to do that by the time the new value shows up, the, this new feature will handle it a little more gracefully than the using the RGB function would do. But, and I think unless you update it, you're not going to see it, uh, see the new value be consistent across all of your charts. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions at this point, and it's, um, at 11.30 over here, so perhaps we will uh, close this. Jeremy, do you see any questions on your end in Q&A panel? Sometimes it comes privately, so. No, not seeing any. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining today's session, and thank you, Jeremy, for presenting interesting information for all of us. Okay, at this point, we'll close this session officially. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.